Dogfighting means fighter versus fighter. Two fast and nimble warbirds twisting and turning on the knife edge of survival. When a lumbering bomber stumbles into the fray, the result is usually certain death. But sometimes, bomber pilots with a special brand of skill and courage face down long odds and find a way to out-dogfight a dogfighter. Now, using state-of-the-art computer animation, you're in the cockpit as heroic bomber pilots go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the most lethal fighters of the 20th century. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights. The Battle of the Coral Sea rages in the skies of the Pacific. Imperial Japan, seeking to tighten its grip on the Solomon Islands, has engaged American carriers and their aircraft in an all-out combat for the first time in the war. In the midst of this epic battle, eight SBD Dauntless dive bombers from the USS Yorktown guard against incoming torpedo bombers. It's a job for fighters, but they're in short supply. Leading the formation is Lieutenant Stanley Swede Vetisa, an experienced SBD pilot. Just 10 minutes into the patrol, he spots enemy aircraft approaching fast, and they're not torpedo bombers. Suddenly, I saw a glint of sun on a bright metal, and I knew that they were coming. A swarm of deadly A6M30 fighters are streaking in from above and behind the SBDs. Perfect attack position. There were nine of them coming down at a steep angle, firing 20 millimeters. And I knew exactly what to do to counter that attack initially. If the SBDs go straight, they'll be sitting ducks. If they turn right, the Agile Zeros will be on their tail. Their only option is to turn into the attack and throw off the Zero's timing. Vetisa calls for a left break. And I yelled on the radio, turn, and nobody, nobody turned for me. The Zeros slash through the American formation. Four SBDs go down in flames in the dogfight's opening moments. Vetisa stays in his left turn, away from the carnage. But one of the Zeros dives on him from 7 o'clock high. And he had been firing at me, but I dropped the nose and sharp under to my left. He came over the top of me. Swede's skillful move has caused the Zero to overshoot. But he knows his slow dive bomber can't outrun the Zero. He must keep the Zero in front of him. The tough SBD pulls a high G 180 degree turn with ease. He had leveled off and he was already coming back head on and firing his 20 at me. It was a dangerous weapon. One 20 millimeter in your engine or it would do you in. The problem with now having a, a Dauntless SPD coming nose on with the Japanese Zero is that Japanese Zero has a 20 millimeter cannon which has a much longer range than the guns on the, on the SPD. The two planes hurtle in at each other. Vetisa must do something to throw off the Japanese pilot's aim. In this particular time, with the proper maneuver as a skid, a uh, skid to the left. Vetisa slams his left rudder to the firewall. The nose skids left, avoiding the deadly stream of 20 millimeter cannon fire.
both pilots stand their aircraft on their wingtips and circle back towards each other. The closure rate approaches 600 knots. Venisa reverses for another pass. But something's wrong. The enemy pilot hasn't made a turn for another head-on pass. He's flying away from Vetisa. I thought at the time he must have been in communication with one or more, because he was immediately joined by a second fighter. We realize now he's in a two versus one engagement. We like to say two v one the hard way. He's the one aircraft versus two zeros. Outnumbered and outgunned, Swede Vetisa faces long odds for survival. The SBD dive bomber was never designed for this kind of fight. The Douglas SBD Dauntless was the most widely deployed dive bomber in the US Navy. It was designed to carry a single 1,000 pound bomb, push over into a near vertical dive, hit the bomb release, and pull into a blackout inducing recovery. The aircraft had two fixed 50 caliber machine guns in the nose and twin 30 caliber trainable machine guns operated by a rear gunner. In the first six months of the war, SBDs contributed to the destruction of nearly half of Japan's carrier fleet. To accomplish its mission, the SBD was given a rugged airframe capable of enduring 12 Gs, essential for steep dives and extreme pullouts. It was also equipped with Swiss cheese dive flaps. The Dauntless featured perforated dive flaps that allowed a dive to occur under slower speed conditions to allow the pilot more time and control to line up on a target when he was in a near vertical dive. All of these features made the SBD an excellent dive bomber. But its very ruggedness made it easy prey for the light, fast, and deadly A6M30. The Zero was designed for air-to-air -air combat. In the first months of the war, it virtually ruled the skies. The Zero is 2,500 pounds lighter than the SBD, and it's 100 miles per hour faster. It has two 20 millimeter cannons and two 7.7 millimeter machine guns. The SBD has no cannon, and the rear gunner is effectively neutralized in a maneuvering dogfight. But a well-aimed burst from the SBD's heavy machine guns can wreak havoc on the lightly armored Zero. Lieutenant Vetisa could at least maneuver, stay alive long enough to get one well-placed shot on a zero, he has a good chance of shooting that zero down. Regardless of the odds, Vetisa is supremely confident of his abilities. He knows he can beat any pilot in a dogfight. The two zeros linger beyond Vetisa's machine gun range, coordinating their attack. Then they make their move. One zero turns towards him, streaking in, cannons blazing. Vetisa jinks left. Then, in front of him, the second zero speeds in for a pass. So here's one coming head on. The other is making a turn to get on my tail. What they did was to place me in a scissors, and I could see the pattern develop immediately. Vetisa is here. The Zeros are here and here. They're flying twice as fast as Vetisa, trying to use their speed to keep him bracketed in. To counter this maneuvering, after a head-on pass, Vetisa will snap the SBD over in an excruciating 9G turn reversal. He'll try to keep the Zeros in front of him, where he can use his nose-mounted machine guns. The sturdy SBD can handle the punishment, but Swede may not. His body can only withstand nine Gs for a few seconds before blacking out. The Zero out in front streaks in. Venisa yanks the stick, forcing another head-on pass with the second Zero.
the Japanese struggled to match Bettis' maneuvers. Turning, jinking, changing its altitude, dropping, jerking the plane up, and pretty violent maneuvers, actually, to keep them from getting a, a, a sight on, on them. The Zeros can't handle the erratic moves. A 9G turn would rip the wings off the Zero. The fight has pushed Vedisa to the ragged edge of human endurance. Then, in an instant, his odds of making it home get even longer. Another Zero joins the hunt. And there's a third plane joins in. And this guy comes from over, I see him coming from overhead, and he rolls over, comes down in a vertical. Swede Vedisa is penned in on all sides. His slow SBD will never outrun the Zeros. Survival now depends on somehow managing to kill his pursuers. May 8, 1942. Lieutenant Swede Vedisa, in an SBD Dauntless dive bomber, is dogfighting three Japanese Zero fighters. Something it was never designed to do. Two enemy Zeros have Swede locked in from in front and behind. But now, a third is diving on him from three o'clock high. The Zero dives on Swede as he jinks aggressively to fend off attacks from the other two Zeros. The Japanese unleash hundreds of rounds. Some slice through Vettis' fuselage. The top SVD keeps flying. Supreme mastery of his aircraft has kept Swede alive. But in the tight turns, he fights to keep his hands and feet at the controls. At times, his body weighs over a thousand pounds. I was jerking that airplane and pushing it hard, diving wide open. And same thing on negative Gs, positive Gs. So as Lieutenant Vettis is fending off these attacks from the Zeros, he's just aggressively maneuvering his aircraft, which is going to put a lot of forces on the body. A lot of G's, positive and negative, so seat in the pants and then floating in your straps, followed by slips, uh, kicking around the cockpit. The violent turns stymie the enemy attacks, but in the back seat, the rear gunner cannot fire. Near blacking out in the 9G turns, he can barely keep his head up, much less aim his 30 cal. The problem being, he's strapped in, and the maneuvers were so violent that he couldn't swing the gun, he couldn't get into position. So after fending off multiple attacks, basically he's just trying to force those Japanese Zeros into making a mistake. The mistake Swede is looking for is in the Zero's turn. After each head-on pass, the enemy pilot must make an extremely tight turn. If it's too loose, Swede's own turn will put him on the Zero's tail. The maneuvers continue, and Swede waits for a moment to strike. The fight has gone on for an agonizing 17 minutes. In the high G turns, his heart pounds in his chest, struggling to pump blood to his extremities. His muscles ache against the physical exhaustion of combat. Vettisa must go on the offensive. On one particular one, he went out a little bit farther, and I was able to pull up on his tail. It's a fatal mistake. Vettisa pounces. And I felt I got a pretty good uh, burst on, on, on him. I see at this time, he's smoking. So I figured it must have hit him. Swede Vettis has gotten in a lethal counterpunch, but there's still two zeros in the air. 
one screams in for another vertical pass. As the enemy pilot pulls up out of his dive, Swede sees an opening and goes for it. He pitches up, bringing his guns to bear. I was able to pull up into almost a vertical, and he was close at hand. He's at an angle, and he's making a turn up there. And I came up practically on his beam, and I got in a good burst on him. And then I stalled and dropped away. Vetisa recovers from the stall. The burning zero falls from the sky, barely missing the SBD as it plunges towards the sea. After evading repeated Japanese attacks with two bold maneuvers, Vetisa has almost evened the odds. Only one zero remains. This was a fight to the death. He's out to kill me, and I'm going to get him. Vetisa in his slow dive bomber is here. The Agile Zero is here, wheeling around on Vetisa for a final decisive head-on pass. He turned around and he came back at me. And uh, I thought that this time he'd been firing so many times, that guy must be out of ammunition. But Vetisa is wrong. The Zero is still lobbing cannon shells at the SBD. He skids left, dodging the Zero's lethal fire. But he kept coming. I knew at that time he was, he, he was intended to, to, to crash me. The suicidal Japanese pilot barrels in, bent on ramming Swede's SBD. At the last moment, I jerked the airplane, went into a, a vertical, and then rolled back. And as I rolled back, it was this tremendous clap as we passed. I knew I saw something fly off, and I thought, my God, I lost an aileron. Miraculously, Vetisa has survived a mid-air collision with the Zero. You would think that two aircraft closing at those speeds probably combined closure rate of almost 500 miles an hour, and then any parts of the aircraft touching, you think it would be catastrophic for both aircraft. Uh, as it turns out, the ruggedness of the SPD uh, ripped apart the Japanese Zero. I turned back on his tail, all right, and he's smoking. And he dove into the cloud uh, about a thousand feet below, and he disappeared. That was the end of the dogfight. After knocking out three Zeros with a lone dive bomber, Swede Vetisa lands back on the Yorktown a hero. He is awarded the Navy Cross for his actions. Well, we often say in, in this business that uh, we stand on the backs of giants. And no kidding, Tuna Vetisa is one of those giants to be able to execute the feat that he executed that day. His talents as a dogfighter now obvious, Swede Vetisa transfers from bombers to fighters and flies an F-4F Wildcat off the USS Enterprise. In October 1942, he makes history again by downing seven Japanese planes in a single day. But in the Pacific theater, other large bombers still regularly met swarms of Japanese fighters. Barely a year after Vetis's famous SBD flight, a solitary B-17 flying fortress would face the wrath of no less than 17 attackers. In one of the most grueling aerial encounters of World War II. A B-17 flying fortress lumbers through the skies above Bougainville in the Solomon Islands. The four-engine army bomber, known as Old 666, is completely alone, beyond the range of fighter escort. The bomber will soon be forced to dogfight in one of the most harrowing ordeals of the war. 
Pilot Jay Zemer and his crew are charged with taking detailed photos of Bougainville and nearby Buka Island for Allied invasion maps. The nine-man crew has volunteered for this extraordinarily dangerous mission. The B-17 cruises into enemy airspace over Buka Island. The Japanese rush to scramble 17 fighters to the attack. Pilot Jay Zemer recalls the moment in this rare archival interview. I should have just broke out and headed for home. And the hell with the mapping. But having been in the infantry and knowing that they're scheduled to go in November 1st on a landing, the importance of doing the mapping hit me. They knew that those zeroes were going to catch up if they did the whole mission. Uh, I'm sure Zemer knew that. Heroically, Jay Zemer maintains his heading, committed to finishing a mission that now seems suicidal. Tension builds in the cabin as the zeros close in. I'd say 30 seconds or 45 seconds before we completed our mission, well, they were up there after us. And, uh, it was hell. The Japanese fighters encircle the American bomber and linger beyond machine gun range, coordinating their strike. The battle to come is a pilot's nightmare, a dogfight in a massive bomber against 17 fighters. The story of old 666 began five months earlier in Port Moresby, New Guinea the base of operations for the 43rd Bomb Group. A reputation for lack of discipline had put Jay Zemer and his men at the bottom of the waiting list for new B-17s. Zemer is forced to look elsewhere. The photographer from the 8th Polar Squadron said, I know where there's an old airplane. Nobody will fly it anymore because every time it goes out, it gets shot to hell. The wrecked fortress is slated to be scavenged for parts. Zemer's men recover the plane, tail number 666, and tow it back to their squadron to patch holes and restore it to flight readiness. A standard B-17E is a four-engine aircraft designed to carry up to 8,000 pounds of bombs. 13 machine guns are mounted throughout the aircraft. But Jay Zemer and his crew will need extra firepower they plan on volunteering for the most dangerous missions, ones no one else will fly. Zemer's men rig the fortress with extra guns. The waste guns are converted to twin 50 cals. An extra 50 cal is fitted in the chin for the bombardier. In the nose, a fixed gun is installed for Jay Zemer to operate. In the end, old 666 is loaded with 19 machine guns six more than a standard B-17. It's the most heavily armed bomber in the Pacific. Now, facing unimaginable odds against 17 Japanese fighters, Zemer's men will need the extra guns. Three Zeros break formation and launch their attack. They take position at 10, 12, and two o'clock. They're trying to split the bomber's defensive fire, but old 666 is bristling with extra firepower in front. The Zeros roll over, inverting as they attack so they can quickly peel away. Jay Zemer fires his nose-mounted gun at the attacker directly in front of him. Rounds slam into the Zero. The fuel tanks ignite and the plane tumbles. Below the pilot's fixed gun, bombardier Joe Sarnowski tracks another attacker. With a long burst, he sends a second plane spiraling to Earth. They've struck an early blow, but their exhilaration soon turns to horror. Explosive 20 millimeter cannon shells from the third zero impact the flight deck and fuselage. He shot out my window, but uh, 
Everything came in on Jay's side, and he got hell. In the pilot's seat, shrapnel rips into Zemer's legs, arms, and wrists. In the nose, shattered plexiglass and metal tear through Joe Sarnowski's abdomen. After Sarnowski got hit, he was dying. He started to crawl back to the nose. The navigator checked to see him and, and kind of stop him and say, are you OK? Sarnowski just kept crawling up to his gun. Meanwhile, there were still many other Japanese fighters to deal with, and, and they set in to, for the final kill. Another wave of Japanese fighters swoop in. This time, a twin-engine Japanese Ki-46 Dyna lines up at 12 o'clock to make a head-on pass. It's a lightly armored plane built for reconnaissance missions, not an all-out brawl. Joe Sarnowski, his hands slick with blood, grips the trigger of his machine gun one last time. Sarnowski saw it, shot it down, and then shortly thereafter collapsed on the gun. The crew continues battling off the marauding Zeros. In the cockpit, blood spurts from Jay Zemer's shredded wrists and soaks the controls. He struggles to stay conscious. The B-17's rudder controls are gone. The hydraulics are shot up. The forward-firing machine guns are out of commission. And worst of all, the oxygen system is gone. And at their current altitude of 25,000 feet, the air is too thin to breathe. Zemer makes a desperate move. I rolled the airplane over and stuck the nose straight down. We better get the hell out of here. Old 666 drops three miles in 40 seconds. They level off at 8,000 feet. The crew can now breathe without equipment. But the 14 remaining fighters easily keep pace with the wounded bomber, maneuvering in front to renew their head-on attacks. To survive, Zemer knows he must make himself as small a target as possible while maintaining a heading for home. He executes a defensive tacking maneuver. By winging the bomber sharply to meet each frontal attack, Zemer gives each Zero pilot only a moment to fire. While most dogfights last only one minute, Jay Zemer and old 666 endure wave upon wave of Japanese attacks for an excruciating 45 minutes. Zemer's arms and legs are lacerated, but somehow he summons the strength to grip the controls and maneuver the massive B-17. And I don't know how he did it, but he did. After burning up almost all their fuel in the dogfight, the Japanese know they must head home. they peel off, lifting their siege of the Flying Fortress. Only with his crew finally safe from enemy fire does Zemer relinquish control of the bomber. Old 666 limps its way to a friendly base at Dobadura on New Guinea. In a B-17 bomber, Zemer and his men have battled 17 enemy fighters and completed their mapping mission. We hit on the end of the runway, and I've made a lot of landing since then, but I've never made one like that. <laughs> Just slipped her in. Medics and ground crew rush to the aircraft. Bombardier Joe Sarnowski is dead. They assume the pilot Jay Zemer is too. We told him to uh, get Jay first. 
and uh, somebody said he's he's gone. Well, I was too weak to respond to that. I wanted to lift my head and tell him, tell him he's full of Amazingly, Zemer survives. 187 bullets and five cannon shells had shredded old 666. Six of the nine men in the crew were hit. For his perseverance in the face of overwhelming odds, Zemer is awarded the Medal of Honor. For returning to his guns while mortally wounded, Joe Sarnowski is also awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. The seven other men of the crew receive the Distinguished Service Cross. It's the most highly decorated mission by an American air crew in World War II. Two decades later, in the hostile skies of North Vietnam, F-105 Thunder Chief pilot Leo Forsness will add his own chapter to pilot lore. He'll face down long odds of his own as he pits his F-105 fighter bomber against a swarm of MiG-17s. In one of the most mismatched dogfights of the Vietnam War. April 19, 1967. Major Leo Forsness pilots his F-105 Thunder Chief, call sign Cadillac Lee. Behind him sits his electronics warfare officer, Captain Harold Johnson. Flying a fighter bomber, they're not meant to dogfight, but soon they'll be forced to. On their wing is Cadillac II, Tom Madison and his backseater, Tom Sterling. They're known as wild weasels. F-105s tasked with finding surface-to-air missile sites and destroying them. Cadillac flight streaks into North Vietnam, and within minutes, spots a missile trail in the distance. Thorsness knows at the base of it there must be a launcher. He rolls in for his attack, separating from Cadillac II to split anti-aircraft fire. Tom Madison called within three or four seconds, about the time he would have been dropping, said, I'm hit. Cadillac II has been hit by anti-aircraft fire. Two minutes or less, I heard a beeper, and then I heard two beepers. That means they were both out of the airplane, meant their chutes were deployed. It's a, not a pleasant sound, because you know somebody's floating down in the enemy territory. In less than a minute, Thorsness has his wingman's parachutes in sight, but he's not the only one. I said, Harry, we got to make it for 1 o'clock, 1.30, and there's no doubt he had a great target there, that guy floating down in the parachute. That's not fair. So as he was rolling in, I plugged it in the burner and started a pursuit on him. When Thorsness punches the afterburner, raw jet fuel is sprayed directly into the exhaust. The F-105 jolts forward. Now going 650 miles per hour and closing on the MiG. The two American flyers drift helplessly toward the ground. I just kept closing closer and closer. And by now I'm just, just about in trail with him and uh, my pipper ends up on his kind of his left wing and so on and I'm getting real close, probably 600 feet, 700 max. And so I just hold down my 20 millimeter Gatling gun. It's not like an old rat-a-tat-tat -tat machine gun. It's, it's like a buzzsaw. Thorsness leads his target expertly. The 20 millimeter Gatling gun incinerates the MiG, pumping out 300 rounds in a three second burst. The tank came off, the wing came off, he pitched up, and I'm pulling real hard, uh, trying to avoid all the debris. The MiG spirals down in flames. The downed American pilots are safe from the MiG's cannons, but they're still drifting into enemy territory where they face years of imprisonment and torture if captured. So I rotate back around and Harry says, Leo, we got MiGs on our ass. I look back over my shoulder and I can see the belly of a MiG. When you can see a belly of an airplane and you're turning tight, that's bad because he's got lead on you. The enemy pilot is already inside the 105's turn. 
The superior turn radius of the MiG-17 fighter will give him a perfect shot at the hulking F-105. Thorsness's only hope for survival is to run. He drops the nose and accelerates away at treetop level, too low and too fast for anti-aircraft gunners to track. It's a thrill to be probably 20, 25 feet in the air, super sun. <laughs> You're moving. <laughs> With a 350 mile per hour speed advantage, the F-105 easily pulls out of range of the MiG-17. But the Americans must still mount a rescue effort to recover the crew of Cadillac II. Leo Thorsness will soon be called back to face long odds. In a fight his F-105 Thunder Chief was never designed to wage. The Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, or THUD as it was known, was not built to dogfight. It was part of a new generation of multi-purpose aircraft built to fight the Cold War. Its Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine gave it a top speed of 1,390 miles per hour, twice the speed of sound. It was equipped with a single 20-millimeter cannon to use in a dogfight. The F-105 was not a very good dogfighter. It just wasn't made to do it. It was made to deploy nuclear weapons in World War III. And the way that it would deploy it would be at low altitude, high speed, and that's how it would survive. It was a very fast airplane, and it couldn't turn. In a dogfight, the MiG-17 easily outmatches the F-105. At 14,000 pounds, the MiG is far smaller than the 50,000 pound thud. The MiG-17 is more maneuverable and packs more firepower. The F-105's only advantage is speed. Leo Thorsness has just used that advantage to retreat back to friendly airspace, but he's low on fuel. Tankers stay in orbit over Laos to refuel strike aircraft returning from combat. Thorsness rendezvous with one and plugs in. As they take on fuel, the rescue effort intensifies. A-1 Sky Raiders, or Sandys, are sent in. Because they're prop-driven, they can fly slow and low without stalling and protect the downed pilots from enemy ground forces until the rescue choppers arrive. A-1 is no match for a MiG-17. Leo Thorsness and his backseater, Harold Johnson, know the A-1s need help. And so we knew the odds are not good. But there was no question, you know, if not, if not now, when? It had to be right now. And if not us, who? It had to be, there was nobody else. Thorsness and Johnson return to the fight. But before they arrive, disaster strikes. A swarm of MiG-17s ambush one of the Sandys. Cadillac lead streaks in to save the lone Sandy. Thorsness is outnumbered, low on ammo, and in a plane ill-equipped to dogfight. April 19, 1967. Pilot Leo Thorsness, flying an F-105 fighter bomber, streaks in to protect a lone A-1 Sky Raider from a pack of enemy MiG-17s. The A-1 stays in the treetops, flying slow and turning sharply. The MiGs can't turn as tightly without stalling. The tactic works, but it only buys some time. So I home in on him. And sure enough, I, all of a sudden, I pick him up there. <laughs> this, this A1 is just turning away. Thorsness is here. The MiGs are here, circling the Sandy here. Thorsness will scream in and use his own aircraft as bait to lure the MiGs away from the Sandy. I saw at least three MiGs. As soon as I was very close to them, a mile out, less half mile, but enough where I could turn up, set up a pretty tight turn, I went at least even with that third MiG. I was probably a beam of him or slightly ahead of him. 
and they thought I was going to try to turn back into them or stick with them. There was no way I was going to be able to turn with three MiGs. As soon as I got their attention, we rolled back out and scooted out of there. By that time, they'd committed to me for at least momentarily long enough for the Sandy to scoot out of there. The fearless maneuver has worked, using his plane's only strength against the MiGs. Forceness speeds away to a safe distance. The MiGs have broken off, but Thorsness knows there is no one left to protect the downed pilots. He wheels around to engage the MiGs again. Over the crash site, the MiGs are waiting for him. They've set a classic trap, the wagon wheel. In a wagon wheel, three or more MiGs form a wide circle. An American pilot can't engage any of the MiGs without having another on his tail. Forceness speeds into the hornet's nest. Sure enough, we fell for their devious trick, and we, we flew right into it. And I didn't see it, so we were just about inside the wheel. Inside the wagon wheel, there are MiGs in every direction turning in for the kill. Forceness must go on the attack. And all of a sudden, I spot the MiG that's coming out of my 1 o'clock position, just about coming in. And about that time, he sees me again, so he cranks it in a little tighter. But I just put my pipper on him, or above, ahead of him, hose down, and, and fire off the last of my ammo. And he kind of flew into the ammo. Thorsness has blasted his way out of the wagon wheel, but the high-speed combat has burned most of his fuel. He must head back to a tanker. Once again, calling on his F 105 speed advantage, he throttles up and makes a run for it. The rescue effort is lost, and the downed pilots are soon captured. All of a sudden, on the radio, I get this call and says, Leo, I have 600 pounds of fuel. Can you help me? A fellow F 105 wild weasel pilot is in a desperate situation low on fuel and lost over hostile skies. In a moment of profound heroism, Thorsness and Johnson ignore their own fuel crisis and direct the tanker to save the lost pilot. I called the tanker, I said, Tanker 2, Green 4 has got six minutes of fuel, and you got six minutes to hook him up or we lose another airplane. Now, Thorsness knows he may not make it back to a friendly base under power, gambling, they climb to 35,000 feet and set a heading for Udorn, an air base 75 miles away. Thorsness only turns his engine on intermittently to maintain the glide. We set up 275 miles an hour, or knots, that's the best glide speed. And we just start gliding and we say, if we can make the Mekong and have enough air, or altitude to eject safely or pass the river, we're free. You can glide two miles for 1,000 feet at 275 knots. So not only do we make our 75 miles to the Mekong, we make it the other eight miles to Udorn. As we're rolling out, you know, just about to touch down, the engine quits. Harry said, he had a, had a great comment. He said, Leo, that was a full day's work. <laughs> 11 days later, Thorsness and Johnson are shot down on their 93rd mission. They will spend six torturous years in captivity. On October 15, 1973, seven months after his release and six years after his heroic mission, Thorsness is recognized for his heroism in the face of daunting adversity. In a White House ceremony, he receives the Medal of Honor. I wear this. I think every Medal of Honor recipient would say, we wear this for those who can't. Thorsness's example of courage and self-reliance is a fitting legacy for today's strike pilots. Increasingly, advances like stealth technology are allowing bombers to go it alone deep over enemy lands. But every advantage is eventually countered, and bombers may again face long odds in fights they weren't designed for. As it's always been, it is the courage and cunning of the pilots themselves that will spell the difference between life and death.